Endurance, it's a big part of cycling, whether that's riding 50 miles, 100 miles, or even the Tour de France. But now, the spirit of endurance is taking hold more and more, pushing ourselves further and harder. I'm no stranger to suffering, but Mark Beaumont and Laura Penhall are absolute experts on the subject, fresh from writing the GCN book on the subject. So, here are their six pillars on how to improve your endurance. So mindset is one of the first chapters and I think you have to start with the mindset because we automatically jump into physical training which is kind of what we know about and there's some plenty of resources out there to sort of head to but we tend to take the mental aspect for granted and when really in endurance this is kind of what gets challenged the most I would say and in endurance it's the biggest arena which exposes yourself to self-awareness and kind of really strips you back to your raw behaviours it, it strips you bare mentally it kind of really takes you to the to the depths and I think if you're going to be going to the well it's worth laying down some foundations in preparation and ensuring you have a few tools in your toolkit to draw on when things get tough for me I think it's about kind of knowing you know you need to know the why behind what you're doing so that when things do get difficult you have a really strong desire and motivation to know why it's worthwhile why you're there and really get that purpose behind your actions will help you to lead to consistent engagement and there's other sort of tools in the toolbox that you can have, such as focusing on your breathing or recognizing what our emotions or behaviors are in response to how we perceive an event. And all of these sorts of these points we've we've tried to capture in this chapter, which is why I think it's so important because it's often the bit that gets overlooked. The reason, the reason that Laura and I agreed to put the mindset and the psychology early on is that I think it's worth questioning why you go for long rides why you push your ability why not just do comfortable cafe rides why not just make it easy and i think at the heart of that is that everyday life is kind of pretty straightforward for most of us sure there's there's things to juggle with family and work and you know finances but ultimately there's not a lot in modern living that really tests us like makes us figure out what we're made of. And so there's something about endurance where you can go out and really pit yourself against the difficult. And so I think it's, the psychology is, is, a, is a reaction to the comfortable every day. You know, the, the fact that life often doesn't test us enough. So therefore, you know, we want to go out and find that stretch. Um, so at the heart of wanting to do something difficult is a sense of living life with one eye in the mirror and going, what is it that's going to give me those life-affirming rides, the stuff that I'm going to look back on really fondly? And also, you know, reflecting on what a, a challenging period it's been for planet Earth, that endurance mindset, that bit of grit and resolve sets you up pretty well for everyday life. So I don't think it's too glib at all to say that if you push yourself hard as an athlete, then you're going to find that process and that determination and that mindset around just knowing what a hard mile is pretty useful when it comes to stuff off the bike as well so body and setup is one of the biggest areas that we then want to look at again to sort of help to prepare us and prevent a poor performance when we're looking at endurance so what do we mean by that i mean the biggest thing for us usually around setup is is looking at your bike setup and I know kind of Mark's got some great points on this in the book about how actually he's ridden for years you know not having looked at his bike setup but that was one of the first things we did when we were doing around the world in 80 days so endurance has become more and more popular over the last sort of decade and with that has meant the bikes have evolved as well meaning there's a lot more to choose from and that kind of looking towards the specificness of endurance is meaning that actually endurance is going towards more the comfort because you're going to need to sit in that saddle and on that bike for many more hours so it's less about the aerodynamic and the performance nature and it's more about comfort so your first key things to look at when you're heading out to start to do endurance riding is 
the type of bike that you're getting, um, but think about also your saddle, your saddle height and saddle being for comfort. But even then you need to try some different ones for longer rides. And, and also alongside that saddle is about that saddle height, the position it puts your feet in, your knees in, the position it puts you on your front end. So saddle and saddle height is key. Your cleat position is key. You've got to think that your feet are locked into those pedals and they're going to be doing a number of revolutions. So again, that's something that often drives knee injuries and niggles is about cleat position. So make sure you check that. And also it can impact on actually some foot soreness that we can get as well. And also your front end setup. You're not going to want that front end to be really low and aero for performance when you're going to be in it for hours. So think more about it might need to sit a little bit higher, a few rises on the front to give you comfort and to offload your neck and your upper body so that there's less pressure and you can endure your ride with comfort. And so there's different people out there that you can look at, but getting your bike set up just a tweak in your saddle height, a tweak in sort of your front end setup might be the thing that needs to offload to sort of prevent any injuries to your knees or ankles, those sorts of things. But the other thing to consider when we're heading out for long rides is actually the endurance we want in our tissues, in our bodies. Um, we often take it for granted that we need to just sit in the saddle and kind of do the mileage, but preparing our bodies and conditioning our bodies for what we're going to be asking and tasking it to do is, is kind of key. So there's some great stuff you can do off the bike that will help you to endure for longer and prevent some of those niggles setting in. In terms of planning, I've always thought that to make a massive leap in performance, to really shift the dial in terms of your endurance bike riding, you need to take a quiet confidence in your own ability, a healthy dose of obsession, and a really, really good plan. And that last point, the planning, I guess people by nature love to make it look like what they're doing is effortless, of course, because style marks matter. But being effortless as a bike rider on endurance doesn't actually mean not making an effort. To the contrary, all that prior prep allows you to cut the faff time during your ride. Things like knowing your route, having the confidence in your training and nutrition, having tested your kit choices. This all adds up. And all, all the things that work and all the other things that you need to, to think about before you clip in, that's what actually makes you look like a pro. It gives you that calm. Um, what you don't want to do is to confuse this demeanor for not actually putting in the prep. Um, but be warned, because it's rarely appreciated amongst your buddies to be a logistics bore. So what we're looking for here is a quiet confidence in everything that you've thought through and planned before you start your ride. Uh, when it comes to cycling past your buddies with that poker face on, hiding your effort, that can be good fun. But when it comes to pretending that you can actually fall out of bed and pull off those massive endurance ride, you're only kidding yourself. So prep like a pro, and then you can pretend it's easy on the big day. Training is probably the favorite topic for any bike rider to discuss, whether it's what you're doing every day, how that's stacking up over the weeks and months towards the big event. But training can also be the hardest thing to actually prioritize in a busy work-life balance. I wouldn't pretend to be able to have a off-the-shelf solution for all endurance riders because the events you're training for are gonna be so unique. If it was time trialing we were talking about, that might be much more specific because to go 10 miles down the road as fast as you can is very different from the entire spectrum of endurance events you might be training for. But in simple terms, endurance bike riders tend to test themselves really hard, train through the ranges, use the turbo over the winter to push their top end speed power, do almost the opposite to what a road racer, a crit racer might do, who would be building up over the winter with the base miles and then sharpening their race towards the summer season. And the reason that us endurance riders tend to use reverse periodization is that we want to really test ourselves physically and mentally over the winter months. Know that we've got a really big range to pull from when we need it. But when we get to our event, 
we're riding well within ourselves. The wonderful thing about endurance is you don't need to go looking for it. It will find you somewhere down the road. And what you're doing in that final two, three months towards the event is you're actually slowing it right down, doing your much, much longer rides and building the conditioning. That's just being used to be on the bike for a lot, lot longer periods, building up what it feels like on your neck, your hands, your feet, your backside. And that conditioning is a completely different thing than having the physical strength to smash out the pedals. Okay, so with fueling, there's some key top points that we would want to summarise that you want to think about and plan for before you even head out for the ride so that you maintain your energy throughout and you get the most out of your session. And those things are, first and foremost, is hydration. And what we mean by that is having a, a bottle on your bike that's water and having a bottle on your bike that is electrolyte. And depending on how long you're going for, you may well also want to get some of your carbohydrates, so your macros, which we'll come into in a second, into your drink as well. So the second point, once you've got hydration that you're looking at and thinking about what your intensity is, what your session is looking like and the environment that you're in. So if it's a hot environment, if you're going to be sweating a lot, then those electrolytes are really key to have in your water bottle and your fluid replacement. The second thing is looking at your, what we call the macros across your ride and also the preparation for it. And macros are made up of carbohydrate, fat and protein. And when you're going into an endurance ride, it's key that you have the energy that you need to fulfill what you're training to do and what the event is. And so where we talk about carbohydrate, that's often your bulk of your energy source, but we also draw on the fat in our carb in those macros, which is more of a longer acting. So when you're cycling at a slower state, we will draw on the, the fat resource that we've, we've ingested. Uh, but then when you're wanting to push up a hill, uh, when you're kind of needing to put the hammer down, when you're increasing that pace, you're going to draw on that carbohydrate store. So you want to make sure that you're fueling and that you've got some in the tank before you head out to do that, because it's going to be short lived or it's going to be ineffective if you're wanting to draw on those carbohydrate stores and there's nothing there. And finally, with the protein, that's ex absolutely essential for rebuilding as well and sort of um, protect our body both from an infection point of view but also rebuilding muscle and tendons and all of those things to minimize our risk of injury and illness and then the final point but definitely not by least is micronutrients which basically keep our body moving and again protect ourselves from injury and illness and those micronutrients are where we look to go for the basic of six fruit and veg at least a day and including some berries and this is where we've seen the success of the vegan diets because basically they're ingesting about up to eight nine portions of fruit and veg a day and definitely are having a boost in their energy and their feel so get those fruit and veg in. And if you're going out on a ride, that can be as simple as some dried fruit, which can also give you a bit of a sugar hit, which helps with that carbohydrate and that hit for when you hit a hill. So that might well be some mangoes or um, dried mangoes that is, or dried apricots, handful of nuts can give you the fats. Um, and it might be say a flapjack you've got in your back pocket to give you that carbohydrate. And those micronutrients can come from having a banana, it can also come from those apricots or anything like that, dried fruit whilst you're out riding. So keeping it simple, look after your hydration, think about your macros, breaking it down to your carbohydrate, your fat and your protein, and think about the micronutrient source that you're gonna get. So recovery for any endurance athlete is the area that is most overlooked or out of balance. When we start to underperform, we think it's because we haven't trained hard enough. So we train more and yet our numbers get worse. And then we think we need to train more again rather than actually pausing and resting. At this point, sort of, there's a great quote from Peak Performance, which is stress plus rest equals growth. And what that means is without giving adequate stress, um, and just resting, you're never going to grow. But with all that sort of stress constantly, if you don't rest, you're just leading to failure, not growth. But the word rest tends to grate on most of us that love endurance training. And I've just wondered, I've toyed with the idea of whether we change the word so it's more in line with all the aspects of training. So we do high intensity training, we do low intensity training, we do strength training. What actually if we called recovery adaptation training? because that's what recovery is. It allows the body time to adapt and grow. 
So the key points in recovery to really plan and think about is one is planning your recovery time. So you maintain control. It's not forced on top of you and you think it's a last minute thing that you have to do. It's planned ahead of time. So you know it's coming and you can actually switch off. Secondly, it's about your fueling. So make sure that sort of recovery, it's all about what's in the tank. Um, and it's all about how we sort of prepare and protect our bodies with what we're putting in, ingesting and hydrating. And thirdly, sleep is hugely important for our recovery cycle. So, you know, make sure we're optimizing our sleep, you're getting the most hours, you're protecting the time and you're getting the most out of it. And above all, there's definitely other adjuncts that you can add in. There are the ice cold baths, the compression socks, there's going to get massage, all of those things, but plan them ahead of time, but don't compromise those three core things. Planning ahead, fueling well and sleeping well. Well, those were Laura and my top pillars for endurance. But of course, it's a massive topic. It's so expansive. I'd love to know your thoughts. What are the key things you think about to push your bike further on those big adventures? So remember to leave some comments below. Let us know what gives you the skills to ride those big distances. Give us a big thumbs up if you enjoyed that and head to the description below where you can find the link to get the endurance book for yourselves. Otherwise, enjoy your endurance riding and get out there. Enjoy your adventures.